Uh, my name is Ron Latt, State Senator from St. Louis Park. Uh, and I uh, want to announce, as, as you have already uh, learned, um, that tomorrow during the omnibus budget bill debate on the Senate floor, I intend to offer two amendments uh, gathered with me today are uh, some of the senators. Uh, these senators have been most active uh, in, in attempting to advance efforts, uh, legislation to reduce gun violence in Minnesota. Uh, and I uh, appreciate their being here in support of this effort. Uh, we were unsuccessful in getting a formal hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee this year or last year. Um, we had a less formal discussion uh, during the Judiciary Budget process when I offered two amendments similar to what I will offer tomorrow, but not the same. Um, I've been working on this issue uh, since I was first elected to the House in 2003, and I conducted hearings in the Judiciary Committee when I chaired that committee uh, in uh, 2014, I believe it was, or 13. Um, so I've had lots of opportunity to listen carefully to what the uh, gun owners and their advocates have said what their concerns are uh, about specific proposals and more generally. So the amendments I intend to offer tomorrow have taken into consideration um, what I have learned over the last 15 or so years dealing with these issues. I'm going to give you a short synopsis of the two amendments and I'd be happy to answer any questions about them. <clears throat> the amendment that I intend to offer relating to background checks uh, utilizes the existing permit to purchase system, uh, but expands the permit to purchase requirement to cover private transactions involving uh, pistols and assault weapons. So the existing permit to purchase system applies to those who want to purchase pistols from licensed dealers. However, if you want to purchase from a neighbor or a friend, um, or at a gun show market or online, you do not have to go through a background check or show any kind of a permit for that transaction to occur. The existing system is very simple. You apply to, for a permit to purchase from a law enforcement agency. They do a background check to make sure that you are not yourself ineligible under existing law to possess or purchase a firearm. Um, and uh, if you qualify, you get issued the permit. This would be exactly the same process, but now you'd have to show that permit to purchase if you're going to buy at a gun show, whether you buy from a dealer or you buy from um, one of the uh, private sellers uh, at the gun show. If you're going to buy from a neighbor, if you're going to buy from a friend, uh, if you're going to buy online uh, when you meet to consummate that transaction. Um, it uh, has a couple of additional uh, benefits. Uh, one is the bill extends the duration of the permit to purchase. Under current law, it's a one-year permit. However, our permits to carry in Minnesota last for five years. So this amendment would extend the permit to purchase duration to five years. It would also match up the, with the current permit to carry uh, law that requires an annual background check for all people who have a permit to carry. So this bill would provide that if you have a permit to purchase, you will also have an annual background check, at least an annual background check. Law enforcement could, if they found it valuable, uh, do more frequent background checks uh, at any time. Uh, this avoids the specter that has been raised by uh, gun owners and their advocates of a registry. Uh, the point of sale transactions or background checks have been a concern uh, apparently over the years because of the fear that the data of the transaction, including the firearm, um, is accessible to the federal government at a limited number of locations, these dealers, and could somehow in the future be aggregated into a database that would constitute a registry. Um, this avoids even that specter because you're not going to be going through a dealer which has limited locations. It will be any private transaction. And this bill provides then that the buyer and the seller would have to maintain and keep written documentation of the transaction. And that that documentation, which includes information on the firearm itself, 
uh, would um, need to be kept and accessible to law enforcement if there's a subpoena, a court order for their investigation into criminal conduct. Other than that, it would not be accessible to the government. And the amendment that you have in your hands now specifically limits the accessibility uh, to those express purposes. Uh, so it should address the concerns about whether or not we're aggregating a registry in this case. Uh, I will note that uh, in this background check generally, both the recent Star Tribune poll, which was conducted, I believe it was by the Mason-Dixon uh, polling firm, a national uh, polling outfit that does these uh, significant statistically valid polls all around the country, found 90% support for criminal background checks, the idea being to keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people. We have already defined who dangerous people are in Minnesota. This bill makes no changes to that. No expansion of who's ineligible to possess or purchase a firearm at all. Existing law in that regard. Um, the Every Town for Gun Safety poll that was also recently released nationally had a Minnesota component to that poll, also showed identical results, 90% support for criminal background checks. And this number holds across demographics and geography, urban, rural, suburban, gun owners, non-gun owners, Democrats, Republicans, the support is very broad and very deep in support of criminal background checks. Uh, so every legislator, I think it's fair to say, at least on a statistical basis, if they were to do a similar poll in their district, would find comparable levels of support for this criminal background check amendment that I will offer tomorrow. And I'm hopeful that they will vote accordingly uh, in support uh, of their own districts. <clears throat> the other bill that I'll be offering is an extreme risk protection order, sometimes called the red flag bill or a gun violence protective order. Um, I have also tailored uh, this bill uh, to address the concerns that have been raised while still accomplishing uh, the important goal of identifying uh, those who, not identifying, once they are identified, once someone learns about a person who is a danger to themselves or others, having some legal tools available to remove the firearms from that person's possession on a temporary basis. So here's how it would work. A law enforcement agency would have the ability to file a petition with a court, not an individual filing a petition with the court. This is one of the concerns that has been raised by gun owners and their advocates, is that a, uh, an estranged spouse, an upset neighbor, anyone who's looking to harass someone could file a petition with the court, convince the court based on an affidavit to issue an order to remove the firearms, and that would happen. Uh, so I understand this concern. Um, it was raised by the ACLU in another state, um, and uh, they made a change and I made a change here. So a family member, an individual, if they suspected that a person was dangerous to themselves or others and they had firearms in the home, they would have to go to their local police department or a sheriff's office. Or in this case, actually, it would have to be a police department unless uh, there's no local police department in that jurisdiction. Uh, and that police department would have the ability to vet that information, to verify if they feel they need to, that the information they're being given is accurate. Um, they can choose not to file a petition with the court for a protective order, um, or they could choose to go forward with such a petition. This bill would make it a crime for a person to provide false information to a police department in an effort to improperly obtain this kind of a protective order. The Police department then would file a petition with the court and would have to demonstrate to the court's satisfaction that a person is a danger to themselves or to others, that there is no less restrictive and reasonable alternative to removing firearms from that person in order to protect them from themselves or to protect the public. If those are the two standards that they're looking at, but there's not an imminent danger present, then there is no court order issued until after 
a full evidentiary hearing. And much of the language in the amendment is uh, dedicated to identifying the due process that's involved in notifying a uh, respondent um, of their rights to have that hearing, um, of the timing of the hearing, uh, and making sure their full due process is complied with. Um, only in the case where there is an imminent or immediate danger of harm, someone, for example, who is very suicidal in their family and convinces law enforcement that they are likely to commit suicide prior to an opportunity for a full evidentiary hearing, um, then uh, the court can entertain an ex parte application for an emergency protective order. Um, if the court concludes that the danger is imminent, they can issue a probable cause warrant for a, the local law enforcement agency, the police department, to go and serve that order and separate the person from the firearms in their home or wherever they are. Uh, that person is then at the same time notified, uh, or as soon as practicable, if for example they're not at home, they're notified that they have a right to have a hearing in front of a judge, a full evidentiary hearing, within 14 days of that order for removal of the firearms. And there's a lot of language in the bill about how to notify them. Um, basically piggybacks on the existing civil rules, uh, but in person or by publication, uh, by U.S. mail, um, and it sets out some criteria for when you know, certain routes are acceptable. Um, they can have a full evidentiary hearing within 14 days of that order. They can get an extension if they wish to do so, um, or for good cause shown. Um, the uh, court would then have a full evidentiary hearing. Now, this emergency order could be issued for anywhere from six months to two years. Um, after a full evidentiary hearing, if the court were to determine that there really wasn't any reason for the firearms removal order to be issued, uh, then the order would be canceled, and that would be the end of it. <clears throat> if they determine that the length of period of time should be different or whatever, they can issue a modified order. Uh, and uh, at any time during the duration of that order, this person whose firearms have been removed on a temporary basis um, could petition the court to reconsider. So if it's a six-month order, they can make an application for within that six-month period. If it's a one- or two-year order, they have one opportunity per year uh, to ask to have that order changed or dropped entirely. So this would be a situation, again, if you've got a person that is going through an, an immediate mental health crisis, for example, and then they go get help. They get to see a doctor, they get prescribed medications, they go into counseling or therapy, the cause of their immediate crisis has changed. Maybe uh, an impending divorce battle has been resolved in family court and the allocation of, of custody uh, time with the children has been sorted out. Uh, you know, whatever the situation was, if it's resolved itself, then a court could consider, okay, that now there's no longer a danger that's involved and they can cancel the order. Uh, so I, I think, I mean, I have attempted to address the due process concerns here. I've attempted to address uh, the concerns about someone just applying to harass a neighbor or, or a uh, spouse or an estranged person um, that the gun advocates have, uh, have brought up so that we hit a, a very moderate ground here. Now, I want to make two other points. One is the public supports this very broadly as well. Uh, the Star Tribune poll did not ask this question. At least that's what I've been informed by um, a reporter from the Star Tribune. Uh, the Every Town for Gun Safety poll did, and it also has 90% support. Um, I think within the subcategories, the support ranges a little bit more, uh, you know, in terms of gun owners in rural Minnesota, uh, but it is still in the very, very high majority range supports this. The NRA has stated nationally that they support uh, the extreme risk protective orders as a general concept. They had some concerns about some particular details in, in, in individual proposals, um, uh, but they are in support of the concept. Uh, Florida's Republican majority legislature and governor enacted um, an extreme risk protective order bill about a month after the Parkland shooting. 
and I believe Vermont is the other state that has also done so with a Republican governor, I know for sure. Both very pro-gun states. Um, I should note that in Minnesota, 62% um, of our firearm deaths are suicides. Um, and uh, so uh, this is the kind of thing where it'll be very important. I'm, I'm proud to announce, uh, pleased to announce that Senator Bach uh, supports both of these bills and tends to vote for them. I believe a statement to that effect has been distributed to the press. Um, and uh, uh, so I think both of these bills um, are very moderate approaches, but should be effective approaches to saving lives and keeping the hand, guns out of the hands of dangerous people without targeting specific firearm transactions. I don't know if I mentioned, but I should for the extreme, uh, uh, for the uh, background check bill, uh, I guess I did. It does not cover hunting rifles and shotguns. Um, so uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, give you more details about it uh, and, and whatever you'd like. So I'll open the floor now. Senator, a little while ago, the speaker told us there are behind the scenes conversation, conversations going on that could lead to at least background check bill that might pass. Are you involved in any of those with Republicans, or do you know of any of those going on between the pro and anti-gun groups? Well, the speaker hasn't called me. Um, He's not and, necessarily uh, involved in all of them. So. Okay. Um, uh, uh, no, I'm not involved in the conversations in the House. Um, I am involved in discussions in the Senate and with advocacy groups. Um, I have not had any direct conversations yet with uh, the the, uh, the gun advocates. Um, other than peripherally and in years past. Um, it is actually my intent to reach out specifically to some of them this afternoon. Uh, once we had a sense of what was happening procedurally with the budget bill and so on, um, I was able to ramp up our efforts on this, and I intend to reach out to them um, as well. So I take it from that you don't have any promises of support from Republicans or from pro-gun groups? Uh, that's correct. Um, I will note that there are a number of Republicans who have senators who have co-authored bills um, that would accomplish or attempt to accomplish the same thing. Um, and the polling shows this is not a partisan issue at all. Um, you know, death is not a partisan issue. You know, if you're a victim, they don't usually ask first to, what's your political party affiliation. Uh, so I'm, I'm working on it. I have actually had direct conversations with quite a few of my Republican Senate colleagues on this. Um, I have, uh, I'm not going to pull a surprise on the floor. Um, I've been talking with them, giving them copies of the amendments, uh, answering their questions, helping them understand what's in there. Because uh, I welcome a full conversation about this, uh, these votes? topics. Do you have the votes? How many of their votes do you have? Could this pass tomorrow? Um, I don't have a vote count for you. Um, I'm confident that we are going to have uh, Almost all, if not all, Democrats voting for it. Um, there are Republican senators who are already publicly in support of uh, bills of this nature. Do you have their um, support on the amendment? I don't have any specific commitments at this time. How will you clear the germaneness issue? How do you keep this from you? I mean, even, how can you even get this to a vote tomorrow? Well, this is an omnibus budget bill that has loads of policy, both budget and non-budget tied policy in it. I think it's pretty hard under the rules to claim that any policy amendments are not germane to an omnibus bill. Um, and this covers all of the subject areas. So this is not an omnibus public safety bill or an omnibus education bill either. Every subject topic area uh, in our budget um, is in this bill with policy. So I think on the merits, it'd be very difficult uh, to conclude that any amendments tomorrow are not germane. Um, there certainly are public safety articles here um, as well. Um, and so I think clearly these are public safety issues. Uh, how do you define, is it defined in statute? Semi-automatic military style assault weapon. That's the, in addition to pistol, that's the background check threshold. Is that, is that term defined in statute? There is already a definition in Minnesota statute for those. And this bill, you know, there's been some discussion at some point about clarifying that definition. Um, I've chosen not to do that at this time. We'll just work off of the existing statutory definition. 
And you mentioned earlier some exemption for hunting rifles. Can you clarify that again? You said it didn't apply. Sure. Well, basically what it's, the, the bill says it applies to pistols and to the semi-automatic military style assault weapons. So by definition, anything else isn't covered. So it doesn't cover what typically is used in hunting rifles, shotguns. Those and kind does that of help you specifically with votes, do you suspect? I think so. One of the objections that I have heard is that uh, uh, they don't see any reason why their hunting rifles need to be covered by all of this. And frankly, you know, most of the public safety risk that's out there, it's not the single shot rifles that are being used. Um, it's, the, it's the pistols that are easily concealed and that are used in, in uh, the, you know, the shootings, or it's the assault weapons that are being used in the mass shootings. Uh, so I, I don't think we lose anything in terms of public safety um, by, uh, by not including uh, the hunting uh, rifles and shotguns. And I know it was a concern of, of the gun advocates, so I tried to address that. Senator, just to, to be clear on this, Tim, yes. back here. Um, so this, your language in your amendment wouldn't require people to go and get a background check after agreeing to make a purchase. They would have to get that permit before and that permit is good for five years, according to your um, amendments, correct? Yes. So some of the concerns I heard um, at the point of sale transactions, if you want to extend this to the other private transactions, you know, you may, you know, you're driving down the road and you see a garage sale and you want to go in and spontaneously decide to buy something, you can't, you can't consummate the purchase if we require point of sale. Um, you'd have, not right away, you'd have to go find a nearby dealer. And there are 90% of Minnesotans live within 10 minutes of a dealer. So it's not, uh, it, it's not impossible, but it, it is a barrier to the transaction. Um, and there'd be an additional cost involved in, in paying the dealer to go through that as well. So this would, you know, someone would make an application just like they would a permit to carry uh, and uh, carry it around with them. So any spontaneous decision to, to uh, stop and find a firearm that they want to buy, as long as they've got the permit with them and they sign the affidavit that says it's still a valid permit, they're not making any misrepresentations, those kind of things, uh, then, you know, they should be able to, to buy whatever they want to buy. As so many as they want to buy? No, no restrictions on numbers. That was another thing that was considered along the way, and uh, some people have proposed that, uh, frankly, on... on on uh, you know my side of the uh, of the equation on this stuff, have suggested that uh, we do uh, you know a permit for each transaction, or a permit for each five transactions, or that permits only last for 30 days or for 60 days. Um, and uh, you know while I respect the attempt to limit access, uh, what I'm most concerned about is the background check and the continuing validity of a background check. Uh, and I figure if it's good enough to issue a permit to carry with an annual background check, it's good enough to do that uh, with a permit to purchase as well. It's the same vetting, um, you know, that would be involved in the permit to carry, uh, the same duration. Um, and uh, again, if law enforcement has any suspicions about someone, um, they have every right to run a background check on them at any time. Senator, with um, Senator Box support of this, how close are you to 33 votes in your caucus? Well, I, I'm not going to give you exact numbers because I don't have uh, commitments from everyone, um, but uh, I'm very, very close, if not there. Within a couple, three votes? Likely, yes. And do you have, do you have any indication of any Republican votes on this at all? Sure. Um, I don't have any commitments on any Republican votes at this time. I'm having conversations with individuals uh, throughout today. Do you think it's possible, remotely possible, uh, or how would you, what, what adjective would you, or what, or what adverb would you <laughs> use to, to describe the possibility of getting a sufficient number of Republican votes? Well, you know, the problem is I don't, I can't predict what the Republican caucus dynamics are going to be on this. Um, <clears throat> if they vote their districts, we should have at least 10 Republican votes. Um, if you just look at the districts in the metro suburban areas, um, if you go greater Minnesota and they vote their districts, I'm, I'm highly confident in the polling results. So if they vote their districts as a whole, we should have probably all of them. Now, I know that's not going to happen. Um, uh, but uh, I would think there are at least a number of Republicans who have come up publicly and stated their support for these concepts, who have authored bills in support of these concepts, um, that uh, if they're going to be consistent 
uh, with their past statements to their own constituents, they ought to be voting uh, for these bills. Um, and the problem now is once the, the arguments in response to these bills <coughs> are addressed in these bills. I mean, I've addressed all of the concerns, except I could never address the concern that any bill is going to be a step down the slippery slope to uh, government confiscation of all firearms in Nazi Germany, right? Which we've all heard. Um, I mean, that's never going to happen. Um, I am committing to you now um, that I will not accept any amendments from my side that attempt to ban assault weapons or attempt to ban high-capacity magazines um, or attempt to ban any kind of firearms, frankly. Um, any, any bills that, you know, those on my side of the conversation uh, would add to try to tighten up uh, this, uh, make it more strict, uh, I would reject. Um, and so I'm committed to this, what I think is a very strong compromise, middle ground position that advances the public safety without in any way infringing on a gun owner's right to own a gun as long as under current statute they are lawfully uh, possessing a firearm. And then you actually anticipated my next question there about the slippery slope. Um, obviously, this legislature can't bind a future legislature, but what kind of assurances would you offer to those who are con concerned about that, that, hey, if we do take this step, that then maybe next year we go further, or a couple of years from now we go further? Well, you know, for, for me, these two bills have been ones that I've been focusing on for the last several years in mean, the background checks and, uh, and risk protection orders. Um, and uh, there's a lot of other stuff out there that we could be focusing on. Uh, the, the nature of these kinds of issues is that once you make some significant progress, uh, everyone steps back, or once you make significant changes, everyone steps back and takes a deep breath and, and turns their attention to other areas. Uh, I can't make any promises as to what other people would do. Can we ask Senator Little if you still have the support of the Republicans that you stood here with earlier in session and why they aren't here with you? Um, well, the first thing I would say, I would let them speak for themselves. Um, I'm did still you ask them to attend. Um, this, I don't. I don't well, believe we did. I organized the press. Okay. Yeah. So yep. they weren't involved in okay. that. No, I, I did not specifically ask uh, them to attend, but they are aware of what we're attempting to do here. Do you think the threats that Senator Jensen and Senator Anderson received? Let him answer first. Sorry, oh. I was still. Oh, I yeah. Um, I don't. Uh, again, I would repeat what Senator Latt said, which is we don't have any specific commitments from anybody on the other side of the aisle. I would say, though, I, I'm still grateful for their support on the bills we offered, and the one that is being offered by Senator Latt's is less restrictive, has less regulations. It doesn't involve the point of sale, but instead involves the permit process, um, which I think is more palatable to people, and, and we certainly hope we have their support tomorrow. Would you say the threats that Senators Jensen and Anderson received have had a chilling effect on their support for these bills? Uh, you mean the political threats? Okay. Oh, the, the phone calls to their homes and things like that. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm not specifically familiar with them. Uh, you know, my first uh, couple of months on the city council in St. Louis Park, I received a death threat because I wanted to call the deer herd to save our nature center. <laughs> Um, I've received flyers in my district in St. Louis Park from an Iowa-based gun advocacy group a couple of years ago uh, that had veiled, well, not so veiled references to Nazi Germany in, in, a, in a heavily Jewish community, and I'm Jewish too. So it doesn't surprise me um, that uh, there are some people making threats like this. And, of course, I get the, the less offensive uh, threats every time that, um, you know, I, I'm in the press advocating for these bills. You know, it, it's part of the job. I guess it goes along with it, and you just have to try to keep your eye focused on the policy that we're trying to make, the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, you know, I think when they look at their own districts, uh, they will find uh, that uh, there are political risks on both sides of their vote. Uh, some will be at greater risk if they vote against us on this than if they vote for us. Uh, and those, of course, are the senators that we hope will, will be politically comfortable uh, supporting these. I want to talk about some of the exclusions here. Um, so uh, as long as when it's relative to relative uh, is defined, um, if 
the recipient relative is eligible to possess a pistol or semi-automatic weapon, then you don't need to do this. Am I reading this correctly? And you don't need to have the, the clearance, the background check? Um, <clears throat> I think actually, I, I don't have the actual language in front of me to, to verify what you're reading, but my recollection is that it just doesn't apply. I mean, the permit to purchase simply does not apply to family, uh, to family transactions. Right, that's what I was, that's what I was Yeah, I mean, so it, there, there's no screening. Now, existing law makes it a crime for a person to provide a firearm to someone else who is not eligible to possess it. And it also makes it a crime to possess it if you're not eligible. So there's nothing here that would change existing law. The, the, the a family-to-family -family transfer, if, if the recipient is ineligible under state law, is banned from possessing a firearm, uh, is already a crime in Minnesota. And this doesn't change that. But this doesn't expand, or, or does it? If, if a father wants to give his son um, a, a pistol or an assault weapon is defined, do they have to, does this apply to them? They would not have to get a permit to purchase okay, to do right. that transfer. Um, and then there's a reference in there to when it's being used for hunting or target shooting uh, in a subsequent one. The fact is that semi-automatic assault weapons as defined AR-15s are used in, for hunting various times and certainly for target shooting. Uh, it sounds like there's a, an exception for a loan for a hunting trip or a shooting competition or something. I'm, uh, yeah, there's an exception in here uh, for a loan between persons who are lawfully engaged in hunting or targeting, target shooting. It's not specific to the firearm type. Um, it just says basically if, if I've got a firearm that, uh, and I've got a friend who wants to use it to go hunting, that's fine. I can give it to them uh, for up to 12 hours without going through the permit to purchase process, without them, the recipient having to have a permit to purchase. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I think that answers your question. Yeah. Well, the target shooting, you also, yeah. uh, um, there's, a, you know, if a teacher is teaching a student, um, you know, they can loan them a firearm to use uh, for, for that course as well. And there are a couple of other exceptions here also. Total of uh, eight. Separate from the family-to-family -family transaction. <coughs> Any other questions or thoughts? All right, thank you very much. Thanks. Of course.